Um, tonight, Jeff Klapes, the traveling librarian, um, comes back for another of his popular armchair travel presentations. This series highlights travel photography and stories and travel tips about destinations around the world. Uh, this month, we'll be going back to England, specifically to the counties of Oxfordshire and Somerset in the west of the country. We'll visit the elegant university city of Oxford, as well as the cathedral towns of Wells and Glastonbury, and go hiking in the Cheddar Gorge, sounds yummy, home of the world famous cheese, but also an impressive wild landscape. And so if you have any questions for Jeff, please direct those to the chat um, to be at answered after the program concludes. And with that, I will turn it over to Jeff. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Great, thanks for having me back again, Jess, um, and welcome everyone. I'm, I'm starting to recognize names um, from your library. It's nice to see some of you again. We do have a small group tonight, um, comparatively. So um, uh, as Jess said, feel free to pop things in the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on that as we go along and answer things. Um, and I always like to hear about other people's experiences. So if you have traveled to this part of England, um, feel free to share um, your opi uh, opinions and experiences about the things that we're gonna um, see tonight. So I will get started now and let's see, I need to share my screen and make sure I'm screen sharing the right one. How does that look? Good, okay. So we will get started. This is a trip I took about um, two years ago. It was actually the fall before COVID hit. Um, and it, I don't remember whether I've done uh, my program on Devon and another one on Cornwall for your library. Um, but if so, um, you may have all seen, all seen a little bit of this uh, trip already. Um, and you can see just how far we went on this uh, by, by looking at the red route. Um, we um, took the opportunity that fall to visit a number of friends who live in the southeast of England um, in various parts, including um, some that you'll meet tonight who live very close to Oxford. Um, so it was kind of fun to not only tour around, but also visit some friends that I don't get to see very often um, and haven't seen since. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity to go back to England sometime soon. We're going to be focusing tonight, pull up my laser pointer here, um, we're going to be focusing mostly tonight on this area up here, which is Oxfordshire and Somerset, which is the area um, kind of over here. Um, and again, just to put it to put it on the map and also give you a perspective of just how big this area is, this is a rough outline of Massachusetts, um, kind of laid over the, the southeast of England that you can get an idea of how this isn't actually that big an area. Um, and um, particularly if you have a car, you can drive around fairly easily. And um, it's probably no more than uh, three hours, three and a half hours to go all the way from uh, London all the way out to the tip of um, Cornwall. So it's an easy place to get around. And um, we'll start with um, talking about the counties. Um, Somerset, which you can see outlined here, is actually one of the larger counties, uh, geographically speaking, in England. It has about one million people, twice as many as neighboring Cornwall. Um, and you can see here the north coast is on the Severn Estuary, which is the, the Bristol Channel works its way into the Severn Estuary as we get all the way up into Bristol. Um, and the county seat is Taunton. It's always fun to drive around England because you see lots of names of towns like Chelmsford, for example, um, that you recognize um, and Wakefield where I'm from, um, but they're all in the wrong place. And of course, my British friends point out to me that it's exactly the reverse, that um, you people <laughs> in New England are the ones who have put them in the wrong places. Um, but it is kind of fun to drive around and see a lot of places that you recognize names of. Um, the um, Somerset, is kind of known in England for its very rural atmosphere and its West Country accent, which I will not at all attempt to duplicate. Um, but in England, it's kind of regarded as a very rustic kind of uh, uneducated. It has that stigma the way we often um, in the North might look at a Southern accent. Um, so there's a little bit of that associated um, with the different classes in England and the way they look at Somerset. 
Um, Oxfordshire, on the other hand, um, which is a little bit further inland, and you can see here the outline, um, is considerably smaller, both in population and in geographic size. Um, but it is tends to be better known because it's closer to London, and of course, because Oxford, which is such an incredibly famous place um, and attracts so many tourists, um, it gets a lot more tourist traffic than Somerset does. Um, we started in uh, visiting our friends in a very tiny little village called Childry. And the only reason we would ever be likely to go here is because we know people who live there. Um, and um, it's about 30 minutes south of Oxford. Um, this is the backyard of our friends, Helen and Will. Um, and they also have another house down on the coast in Devon um, where um, Helen's mother lives in that area. So they kind of, they're both retired now. They go back and forth. Um, but this is their lovely house. It looks old, but it's actually very new. Um, and here they are we're having a lovely lunch in the sun, um, the uncharacteristic sun in England. And we loved Childry. It's a very tiny uh, village and a very typical village. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever watched British uh, television shows like something like The Vicar of Dibley, for example, which is a famous comedy. Um, and Childry is a village that really gives you that same sense of, of a small insular village um, in, in rural England. Um, but as I said, the, the thing that's kind of interesting about it is many of the houses that, that I'm showing you in these photographs are actually very recent. They've only been built in the last maybe 10 or 20 years, and they were specifically designed to fit in with the style um, of the rest of the community so that um, they look like they've been there for years. Um, here, on the other hand, is a house that is genuinely quite old. Um, there's a number of thatched roof houses um, in Childry and, and all over England. Um, this is one of the oldest ones in the village, and it's particularly noteworthy. You can see that the, the roof is really huge. It comes all the way down to the ground, this big um, protective roof um, that almost reaches the ground on the sides of the house. And Childry also has its own manor house um, where the family still lives and they have a village fete every, every year that's sponsored by the family and everyone goes to the grounds of the manor house and um, has a good time. Um, so it's, it's very typical of the kind of rural village life that you would see in England. And they also have a lovely parish church. This is the Church of St. Mary the Virgin, which goes back to about the 13th, 14th centuries. Um, and it has this uh, really nice uh, churchyard outside. And it looks out over the rural landscape where, uh, which is very agricultural around here. This is the corner just outside of where Will and Helen live. Um, and if children can be said to have a downtown, this is it. Um, it's very small. Um, <laughs> this is the uh, extent of the traffic that you're likely to see in downtown Childry. And some great examples of the typical uh, houses that you'll see. Um, thatching is very common in, in England um, and there's, uh, it, it tends to be kind of an expensive thing to do. Um, there are, it's estimated that right now in England, there are about 60,000 houses that still have thatched roofs. Um, and there's about a thousand professional thatchers um, that still do the work, which these days tends to be pretty expensive. Um, they often will cover them with mesh. Um, I don't know if you can really see that in this uh, particular photograph but they will cover it with like chicken wire mesh um, that's not really visible unless you get up close. And the reason they do that is because thatch tends to attract vermin like um, uh, mice and rats and, and more likely birds um, that try to dig in and use the thatch for their nests and, um, and will burrow in there. So the, the chicken wire over it tends to prevent that from happening. But even so, thatching is expensive and requires pretty significant and frequent maintenance. So it's not as common, certainly, as it used to be 
um, centuries ago. Um, but it's beautiful to see, and um, you'll find many of the homes in a lot of these villages do still have it. These are all just scenes of downtown Childry with the different styles of houses. And uh, within walking distance, it's only about a two minute walk around the corner. Um, this is Helen and Wills Street. They just, uh, you turn into this little side street and, and here's their house. Just outside of Childry, um, only barely a few miles away, is a very interesting place called Huffington, um, which is famous for its prehistoric chalk horse. And obviously this is not my photograph, this is an aerial shot, um, but I needed to show you that because it's, it's difficult to see the shape of this horse from the ground. Um, unless you get up in the air, it's, it's difficult to see the scope of it and, and just how beautiful the design is. Um, this is a, a chalk carving into the side of the hill called White Horse Hill for obvious reasons. Um, and the, the, the design itself is about 360 feet long. And they estimate that it's somewhere around 3,000 years old. And it's one of the oldest of a number of similar figures that you can see in different parts of Britain. Um, what it is, is that under the, um, under the growth of plants and grasses on the hillside, um, most of the underlying um, soil is chalk. So if you cut away the soil, and the topsoil, you will find the chalk underneath, um, which is bright white and uh, makes an in, uh, interesting design. Um, obviously, despite how old this is, um, they've done a lot of uh, restoration since then. And every year they do clean it up and make sure that it stays uh, pristine um, because otherwise it would gradually get, um, you, you would lose the bright whiteness um, and plants would start to grow into it. But it's a beautiful area, aside from the horse, you can see here we are looking roughly north um, over the downs, where you can see um, on a very clear day, you would be able to see almost all the way to Oxford, which is about half an hour north of here. Um, we were lucky enough to be there in really perfect weather. Um, so there were lots of people out walking. Um, there were terrific um, long distance hiking paths. Um, and there's also quite a few other prehistoric sites to see in this area besides the horse. Um, there are tombs and standing stones and barrows, which are um, another kind of tomb. Um, here's a better view of the, house, of the horse from ground level, and you can see just how difficult it is to actually get a sense of what the, what the design is if you're not up high. Um, they do have volunteers that go there every year to try and um, make sure the weeds are pulled and it stays nice and clean. Um, and you are not allowed to actually walk on the horse itself. Um, but this is the countryside. Um, if you enjoy pleasant country walks, um, what a beautiful spot for it. And if you get as lucky as we were with the weather, um, it's just, it's picture, picture perfect England. This part of England is not particularly dramatic in terms of its landscape. There's just a lot of um, nice agricultural fields and small villages. The hills and the downs are, are not terribly high, maybe a few hundred feet, but it's enough for you to be able to see quite a distance. Um, again, here we're looking roughly northeast um, and you can't really see Oxford, but Oxford is kind of off in that distance way at the top of the screen. We also took a little bit of a walk um, off towards uh, this copse of, of uh, little woodland off in the distance where there's a fascinating ruin, um, another prehistoric site that's called a, um, a barrow, which is a tomb uh, built out of standing stones and capstones. Uh, you can see the, the child that's in this uh, image gives you a rough idea of the scale that we're talking about here. Um, originally, this barrow would have been covered completely with earth. So it would have been a long, low earthen mound. Um, and it was built about the same time as um, the, the chalk horse was. So we're talking at least 3,000 years or so ago. Um, and 
uh, obviously the the covering the the soil covering has disappeared in the meantime. So all that's left is the stones. But you can see um, what you would have done is entered the barrow, and there would be a hallway that takes you into the tomb that was covered with stones. So it's still a pretty evocative site even today without the without the barrow on top of it. And the forest around here is beautiful. There's a lot of oak trees and walnut trees. Um, it's, it's just a delightful area to stroll around. But the big highlight of Oxfordshire, as you can imagine, um, is the city of Oxford, which was founded in the eighth century um, and is famous for its extremely old university, um, but also its immense architectural beauty and really vibrant culture as a as a major university town, there's a huge amount of cultural activities going on, but it's also a pretty big town. There's about 150,000 people. So aside from uh, Oxford University, there's quite a lot of other stuff going on as well. It's also very easily accessible from London by train. It's only not even an hour and a half by train. So if you are ever in London, um, it makes an easy day trip on the train. And there are also plenty of uh, organized bus tours that you can take um, that will uh, make a day trip up there, um, take you around some of the famous sites uh, and bring you back to London by late afternoon. We were fortunate though uh, to be able to go there with Will, our friend um, from Childry, because he actually uh, attended Oxford University. And because of that, we could get a personal tour of his experiences and also get into the college that he went to, which is not easy for tourists to do unless you know somebody. Um, Oxford is the second oldest university in the world, um, even today, after Bologna in Italy. And it has been in continuous operation for over 900 years. What you may not know is that it's actually divided into um, no less than 39 different colleges um, that vary in size, most of which have only a few hundred students at most. Um, so each one has its own particular part of the city, its own chapel, its own dormitories, its own um, halls, its own cloister, um, and its own identity. And Will went to um, one of them called Merton College, um, and he was able, um, as an alumnus, uh, he was able to give us a private tour um, to get in and see an area that we would not have normally been able to go into. Um, obviously, Oxford is very typical Gothic architecture, uh, like you would expect to see in a British university. Um, they are kind of modeled on the old monastery system. So there's, um, there's a chapel, there's a dormitory where the um, students would eat, there's a refectory where they would dine, um, there's usually gardens and a cloister. Um, and it really still, after all these centuries, still uses that kind of monastic system. Um, this is one of the buildings that um, Will lived in when he was a student years ago. He is retired now. Um, there's also a lot of playing fields around. Um, so you'll find um, gardens and playing fields um, all around the different schools. This is the edge of Merton College over here. Left. And here is Will in front of um, another one of the residences that he lived in when he was back to college. To give you a, just a rough idea of um, the, the scope of the college, this is the plan just of Merton, which occupies maybe three or four of the city blocks in Oxford. It was founded in the mid uh, 13th century and today has about 500 students total that includes both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, so you can see that um, it's mostly built around a couple of small quads um, where the chapel and um, the dormitory and student rooms are. Um, and then there's a couple of additional blocks where there's um, some more student rooms and uh, classrooms and so forth. But each of the 39 schools um, in that are part of Oxford University have this kind of plan where they occupy a particular corner um, of the city and they're spread out all over the place um, and you can um, do walking tours to explore the different ones. Some of them are much bigger than others and, and much more famous than others as well. Um, this is the cloister in Merton College. 
and um, here's a student practicing the organ in the chapel. Merton even has its own botanical garden with a variety of unusual plants, at least unusual for Britain, at least. Um, and if you've seen any films like uh, Harry Potter or any number of other British films or mystery shows, um, this kind of architecture will probably look very um, familiar to you because um, it's used in all kinds of British films um, where you're trying to, they are trying to give the sense of old England because it really hasn't changed very much, at least on the exterior. This is the outside of the chapel and the entrance tower over here on the right um, is where you enter from the street. But besides all of the colleges, um, the, the streets of Oxford, the city of Oxford, are almost like a museum of the history of British architecture because um, there are so many different time periods represented um, all the way back to the founding of uh, Oxford University centuries ago, but also Georgian buildings uh, from the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, Victorian buildings, and even interesting 20th and modern 21st century buildings too. Much of what you see in Oxford um, is built in a very creamy gold stone. Um, unfortunately, the, the day that we were there wandering around with Will, um, it was kind of overcast, um, so you couldn't see quite as much. But when the sun hits these this old, um, very warm colored limestone, um, the whole city turns uh, a creamy gold, which is really quite beautiful. Um, here's a, an interesting spot called Logic Lane, which was um, actually the location of a school of logicians um, centuries ago, which is why it got that name. And again, a nice street where you can see a mix of um, different styles of buildings. We did stop um, in a cafe, the local coffee shop, where um, supposedly, according to the place, um, back in 1654, this is the first place in England where coffee, that exciting new beverage from um, the exotic parts of the world, um, came to England for the first time and was served here, or so they say. Uh, but here's a good example of a completely different kind of architecture from a different time period. These are Georgian row houses, um, probably from like the late uh, 18th century, maybe early 19th century, um, that are much more regal and um, elegant and simplistic in their style. And they often are print painted in these beautiful pastel colors. And I think certainly, uh, particularly with the advantage of someone who spent so much time there, um, I think one of the joys of Oxford is just wandering around the streets, because um, particularly if you get away from the high street where all the tourists and shops are, there are some lovely residential side streets that are very quiet um, and are like stepping back in time. Lots of beautiful lanes um, and narrow little alleyways that will take you down to a pub um, tucked around the corner where you might easily miss it. There are even Elizabethan era houses like um, this excellent example here. And the local Bridge of Sighs, which is um, similar to the one that you might have heard of or seen in Venice, Italy. Some of the major buildings that you can visit as part of a tour of Oxford um, are some of the ones that are really concentrated around the center of the city. This is the Sheldonian Theater, which was designed by um, Sir Christopher Wren. He's also famous for having designed St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Um, and this was built in the 1660s. And just around the corner is the Bodleian Library, which of course, as a librarian, I had to make a pilgrimage there. Um, it's a pilgrimage site for any librarian, and it's the main library for the university um, and the second oldest in England. Um, it's an unusual building. You can see it's clearly Gothic, but it's a little, um, they've almost overdone the Gothic archers, arches on the front, uh, on the facade. Um, but it is, it is quite old. It was established originally in 1602 and is still the primary library for, for the university. 
um, they own a collection of 12 million items. Here I am as a librarian proving that I was there. And the courtyard in the center is quite beautiful. They have the original um, schools indicated, uh, the School of Metaphysics and the School of Religion, and the School of uh, various other things all around this beautiful courtyard. Um, and the courtyard or, or quadrangle um, is, it's just a stunning space and um, it's dominated by this tower, which is called the Tower of the Five Orders, which was built in 1610 or so. And the reason it's called that is because it has the five major architectural orders displayed on the facade and they start at the bottom and work their way up. So there's, um, there's Tuscan columns here, then Doric columns, then Ionic columns, then Corinthian columns, and way up at the top is what is called um, composite columns. Um, and that was specifically designed that way as um, an homage to the, the history of the architectural orders. Um, just outside that quadrangle is another very famous place called the Radcliffe Camera, um, which is probably the single most recognizable monument in all of Oxford. Um, it's uh, a later building. It's a neoclassical building that was built around the mid-1700s. Um, and it was originally um, built as a science library, um, although now it is, it, it's kind of been absorbed by the Bodleian library system and is now used as a reading room. Um, because uh, a lot of the library collections have been redistributed, but it's still part of the library system. And it is completely round um, and very neoclassical and elegant, typical of its era. Um, completely different um, is, uh, there's a lot of modern architecture actually in Oxford as well. And this is kind of an alarming thing to see if you don't expect it. Um, this is a quirky sculpture of uh, a nude man standing on the roof of this uh, this building. Um, he's slightly larger than life size, but um, if you're walking down the street and you don't know to expect it, um, it can be uh, a bit alarming. It was um, it was installed in 2009 by a British sculptor called Anthony Gormley. And again, just some uh, scenes around the city. If you like museums, there are a number of places that you can visit as a tourist. Um, this is the Ashmolean Museum, one of the oldest public museums in the world, um, which was started in 1677. Um, this building is actually a bit later from the 19th century, but the institution itself is very old and it focuses on archeological um, objects and uh, art from the 19th century. And they have really superb collections there. There's pubs, of course, as you can imagine, all around Oxford. This particular one I'm uh, pointing out uh, because the Eagle and Child is famous for having been a frequent hangout of two people I'm sure you've heard of called J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, two of the most famous uh, writers, uh, British writers of the 20th century. Um, and back when they were students, um, and later when they were teachers, um, they um, hung out at this, they were known for hanging out at this particular pub. Um, someone was just asking, I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat. Um, someone was asking about the tree. Um, I think those are actually morning glories. Um, it's not a tree, it's they're hanging baskets of flowers um, from the lampposts um, that are decorated around this around the city. And I, I think they're just morning glories in pots. Um, somebody else was asking whether the individual colleges have their own libraries, and I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, I, think, um, I think the answer is no. Um, most of the, um, the library system is really focused on uh, the central system through the Bodleian. Um, I'm not 100% sure of that, but I, that's the impression I got from talking to Will. Um, and again, to, to give you some comparison between new and old, um, as old as Oxford is, that doesn't mean they don't have some really dramatic, um, very modern architecture as well. Um, the, the glass thing that you can see on the right is called the Blavatnik School of Government, um, which was built only in the last maybe 10 or 15 years. And way behind it 
um, you can see um, this, this is just the juxtaposition between new and old. Um, but right behind the Blavatnik School is Oxford University Press, um, which is the largest university press, academic press in the world. And it's um, also one of the oldest. It's about 400 years old. Um, someone also uh, just asked why why that they say in um, in uh, in Oxford you are said to to read a particular um, area of study. That's just a British expression. In the same way that um, here in the U.S. we would say I study archaeology, I study um, the classics. That's just um, that's just the way the British speak. Um, and someone else. Oh, great. Um, we have an expert who actually um, got a PhD back there years ago and says the answer is yes, that each college also does have its own library in addition to the Bodleian system. That's actually similar to, um, I didn't go to a place anywhere near as exciting as Oxford, um, but um, I went to Wesleyan University of Connecticut, which is tiny in comparison, but did have a university system but many of the, the different um, academic departments had their own small libraries for their students, um, but they were all subsumed into the larger system. So it sounds like this might be similar. Um, here are some modern buildings with study rooms for students and a kind of humorously named restaurant. Um, once you're through with your uh, tour of the uh, university area. It really is delightful to wander around the um, the the high street and the business district um, because there's some gorgeous architecture and um, plenty of interesting shops um, and restaurants and bookstores and and so forth. Um, and much of that area is um, from the 19th century. There's a lot of really nice Victorian architecture like this. Um, I think the only reason I took this photograph is because I was amused by the very unfortunate surname of this poor couple. Um, but here are some good examples of commercial buildings, many of which were built in the 19th century, um, some to emulate earlier styles of architecture, um, and some of which are genuinely extremely old, like this Elizabethan one, which is now uh, uh, a restaurant. There's also a downtown monument called the Carfax Tower, which is all that remains from a church from the 12th century. Um, and it's, uh, it's about 75 feet high. And supposedly, um, no building in downtown Oxford is supposed to uh, be taller than this structure, although I'm not sure whether that's one of those things that's um, uh, an actual legal requirement or um, just a gentleman's agreement, because there are certainly a large number of big buildings going up around Oxford, um, but particularly um, more so on the outskirts than downtown. Uh, the mechanical clock that you can see here um, is not as old as the church itself. The clock is actually from the 19th century, but it's still a lot of fun. Um, you can climb the tower and you can also uh, uh, watch the mechanical clock do its thing every hour or so. Um, Harry Potter is extremely popular both in um, Oxford and also in Cambridge, um, partly because of the atmosphere and uh, partly because um, a number of the films um, used uh, locations in both Oxford and Cambridge as, as filming locations. There's a terrific um, market, public market, um, an old market hall um, that I found really fun. There were a lot of nice shops, both for tourists and, and also for locals to buy uh, different kinds of products. And they had some interesting art like this hanging from the ceiling. One of the uh, things that I kind of found surprising while I was there um, is the incredible number of Asian tourists who for some reason find um, historic England um, just fascinating, uh, possibly just because it's so very different from their own culture. Um, and we saw quite a few people, Asian tourists there, who were dressed up in Harry Potter costumes. And it also seems to be a big thing to get married in Oxford. Um, and here is a couple um, 
either on their way or on their way back from a ceremony that they had just had that afternoon. Um, I also see someone was just asking if I have read the Inspector Morse books. Um, and no, the answer is I have not. Um, I've seen some of the, uh, the TV series, but um, I hope um, I am retiring next week. So I will have a lot more time to do things like catch up on all these books that I wish I had read at some point. I will add them to my list. Um, not too far away um, in the same general area, a little bit south, is a lovely small town of about maybe 2,500 people. Um, also a very old town, um, at least a thousand years old, called Bampton. And the reason I mention it, um, and excuse me, and I'm showing you a few pictures, is that um, it was made much more famous recently as one of the filming locations for the Downton Abbey TV series. Um, here's the public library where you can pick up a copy of a little walking tour that will take you around um, Bampton and show you some of the interesting historic sites and also some of the places where they filmed um, scenes from, from Downton. Um, this is, if, if you've watched Downton Abbey, um, anytime they show uh, the village of Downton as opposed to uh, the house itself when they, when they go into the town of Downton, um, most of those scenes were filmed somewhere in or around Bampton. Um, and you can see why it's a, it's a beautiful town, um, considerably larger than Childry where our friends live, uh, but the same kind of style. Here is the house. Um, if you're familiar with the program at all, um, you may remember Penelope Wilton's character. Um, and this is the house, the exterior of this um, is that um, was used as uh, a location for the house that her character lived in. And um, if you like walking tours, it's a, it's a pretty small town, so you can walk across from one end to the other in only about 15 minutes. So it's a, a very pleasant spot to stroll around. Um, we're going to head southwest now. And I did want to show you something a little bit different from everything else that, that you've seen so far, just because it's so much fun. Um, this is the magic roundabout in the town of Swindon, um, which is probably not a place that you want to visit. Um, Swindon is just sort of a, it, it's definitely not a place tourists would bother to spend any time. Um, but being someone who's interested in traffic planning and um, interesting road designs and stuff, um, I we we really felt that we had to drive here just because um, what's called the Magic Roundabout um, is famous um, in this area for being pretty pretty crazy. And certainly, for those of you who live in Ma are, are from Massachusetts and are familiar with rotaries like we have here, um, Europe has way more rotaries. They call them roundabouts there. Um, than we do here. Um, but this is probably the most extreme one that you will ever see. Um, and of course, it, for uh, a visitor coming from the United States, it's even more complicated because, of course, they're doing it in exactly the opposite direction than uh, uh, a US driver would because they're driving on the other side of the street. Um, what it does is it brings um, five major roads um, into a single rotary um around which there are five smaller rotaries as you can see um so you would enter um, if you were coming in here um you would enter here you might go this way work your way around and then go around this rotary and exit or any number of other things um it was built in the early 1970s and um, it's become quite famous since then it's not actually the only one in britain um, there are a few other similar ones uh, elsewhere, but this is definitely the most famous. Um, and if you're really into this sort of thing, you can even contact on the internet. Um, there's a society called the um, United Kingdom Roundabout Appreciation Society. Um, they're kind of like train spotters, but they're very specifically um, focused on the excitement of rotaries in Britain. So <laughs> um, if you're ever in the area and you're an intrepid driver, it might be fun to drive through it and see how well you do. 
it helps to not do it by yourself. Having a navigator as a co-pilot uh, probably helps. Um, but we went through there on the way to Somerset, which is towards the west, um, as I showed you on the maps initially. And um, we again had perfect weather to go to Cheddar, which is a town, um, aside from the cheese, it's an actual town, um, about 10 miles west of Bath. And um, it's famous not just for its cheese, but also for an incredible natural landscape there that seems very un English when you see it. Um, the town of Cheddar is at the entrance to the gorge. There's about 6,000 people. So it's not a huge town, but it's, it's decent sized. And um, it is obviously made world famous because of the cheese that they've been making there for a very, very long time. Um, in fact, something around 800 years of cheddar production. Um, cheddar accounts for about half of the cheese that's sold in Britain. And it's the second most popular cheese sold in the United States. Um, you may guess, you may wonder what the most popular cheese is um, in the US. And um, I'll tell you it's mozzarella and you can probably guess why it's because of all the um, it's because of all the pizza <laughs> that we eat here. Um, but um, real cheddar, as opposed to a lot of the fake cheddar that you find all over the world, um, real cheddar is involved, involves kneading salt into the curds during the processing. Um, and it also requires significant aging. Really good cheddar has almost a, there, there's almost a crunchy feel to it. Um, and it was nice to be able to, to be there and try some really interesting different, um, different cheeses. Um, and not surprisingly, the restaurants and shops there specialize in selling cheese um, and serving food that, has, uh, that uses cheese in it. One of the unusual things about cheddar that is different from a lot of other cheeses, particularly in Europe, um, is that cheddar has no official government special designation or protection. Um, many other parts of Europe do that. France and Italy, for example, um, have um, uh, what, uh, they call them different things in different countries, but for products, for very special local products like wines and cheeses um, and, and so forth, specialty products, um, the government has given them special protective designation. Cheddar does not have that. Um, and as a result, um, people all over the world are making all kinds of different cheeses um, that they call cheddar because they're somewhat similar, um, but they don't necessarily have to be made in or anywhere near cheddar in England. And they don't even necessarily have to be made using the same um, types of processes, which is too bad because real cheddar um, is quite delicious and uh, it's worth uh, paying a little extra to try some really good good cheddar cheese that's made in the traditional manner. Um, but while you're there, um, you should also take the time to explore the gorge, which is a very un-British kind of landscape. Um, it's a narrow limestone gash in the countryside up to about 450 feet deep. And we're right just at the beginning of it here, but you can see the town of Cheddar um, off uh, at the entrance to the gorge where the land flattens out a bit. Um, again, here we are just a little closer to the town itself. But the gorge is quite spectacular. You can drive all the way down um, from one end to the other. Um, if you're not into hiking or, or don't have the stamina for that, um, you can just drive and get a pretty good um, idea of just how impressive it is. But if you are interested, um, you can climb and there's a good um, circuit hike that takes maybe two, two and a half hours to go all the way down one side and back the other. Um, you can also do rock climbing in the area as well. This is a panorama looking out over the entire rim. It was carved out during the uh, past glacial periods by melting ice. Um, and there are a lot of caves in the area as a result of that, um, some of which are open to the public and some of which are actually used to, uh, to do uh, the aging of cheese. So we drove uh, through the bottom, but we also did the hike along the top 
um, because the weather was so nice. And there are really great views uh, from the top because you can, it's, it's so narrow that you can very easily see across the gorge from one side to the other. And you can also see off into the distance, way off um, that little thing that sticks up on the hill in the distance is a place that we'll be going to shortly. Um, if the weather is clear, you can see all the way there, that's Glastonbury Tor. Um, and the old church tower that's on top of that. We'll see that close up in just a little bit. So the hike that we took, um, it's except for the part where you have to climb up to the top and then down again, um, it's, it's a pretty moderate hike. It's not very strenuous. Um, and in a, like I said, maybe two hours, a little over, you can go all the way around the rim and see the gorge from all the different views, including straight now. and out again back out over um, the town of Cheddar off into the distance. Yeah, um, you, can, you can even see some people <laughs> waving at us from the opposite side of the gorge way up there. Um, it's such an unusual spot because if I were to show you pictures of this without telling you where you were, I, I think most people would be um, one of the last places they would think of is that this might be Southern England. Um, you just don't picture this kind of landscape there, but um, uh, and that's why it attracts so many um, hikers and rock climbers. It's just um, it's a, a fascinating spot in the middle of the West Country. Um, heading a little further again to the south and west as we get into Somerset um, is a town called Wells. Um, which was often associated with Bath. And it's, it's maybe seven, seven or eight miles from Cheddar. And this is one of the most beautiful cathedral towns in, in uh, England, uh, about 12,000 people. And the cathedral, the, the town is beautiful, but the cathedral is one of the most incredible ones in all of England. Um, it also happens uh, to be the hometown of a well-known um, British mystery writer, um, Elizabeth Gouge, who you may, may have heard of or read. She's not as popular these days as she used to be, um, but she lived in this beautiful atmospheric house in Wells. And Wells actually gets its name from the fact that back in Roman times, um, there were three wells, water wells. Um, and so it took its name from that and grew over the centuries into a, um, a market town and then a cathedral town. Um, immediately adjacent to the cathedral is what's called the Vicar's Close. Um, and this was built in the 14th century and is considered to be um, the oldest residential street in Europe. Um, and it's um, obviously blocked off for pedestrians only. Um, and it's beautiful in part because it's so uniform. Every one of these buildings is exactly the same um, and in pristine condition. Each one has a little tidy front garden, um, no cars. And if you walk to the other end, this is the Vicar's Library. Um, I happen to notice um, this unusual <laughs> resident way up in the attic of one of the houses. Um, and if you turn around and look back from the library, um, you look all the way back down the close to the, um, to the side of the cathedral. And again, we, we were very lucky in our timing because we were in Wells um, kind of late in the afternoon on a very beautiful sunny day. And that's the perfect time uh, to see the, the stone that this is the same kind of stone that is used in so much of the architecture in Oxford, where I said, um, if the if the light hits it, it just it becomes so warm and so beautiful. This is the west facade of the cathedral, which is very extravagant, and it looks out onto this big open green. Um, it's about uh, 150 feet wide and was built in the late 14th and early 15th centuries. Um, Presumably, it was originally supposed to have spires, 
on the top of the towers and they were never built. Um, but nonetheless, the, the west facade is still incredibly detailed, absolutely gorgeous. Most of the figures that you're seeing here are life size or close to it. And as the sun drops, um, you can see how um, the late afternoon sun um, from the west turns the whole facade gold. It's, it's just um, an incredible sight. But the interior is also uh, quite fascinating, uh, particularly for me as uh, an architecture history student. Um, the most distinctive feature of the uh, interior of the cathedral is this, what, what's called a scissor arch. Um, and these are very rare, um, but you can see why they're called that. Um, this was actually added later um, in the 14th century, not at the original building of the church, but um, all four sides of the transept have these scissor arches, um, which are this just very unusual design that um, you don't see very often. Uh, they, they do exist elsewhere in some European cathedrals, but it's a fairly unusual site. Um, and the ones at Wells are among the most beautiful that I've ever seen. There are plenty of famous dead people. And you can also um, explore other parts of the cathedral. These are the uh, very old worn steps that go up to the chapter house, which is also a highlight because of the um, incredible vaulting that you can see here. There's a single central column um, that explodes into this fan vaulting in the center of the chapter house, um, which was um, finished in 1310. Um, there's also a very early astronomical clock from the 14th century um, in there, and um, another chapel called the Lady Chapel, um, which is tacked onto the back of the, the church where the apses are. This is a, um, a collection of early 14th century stained glass. The whole structure is oct octagonal. It was originally built separately from the cathedral, and later it was attached as the cathedral grew. Um, and it's now uh, at the very east end behind the altar. So it's been subsumed into the rest of the church, the cathedral as, as it grew over, the, over time. Um, and there's also a library, which was built about 100 years later. Um, and unfortunately, most of the books in the collection were lost during the Reformation. Um, so the collection now consists mostly of more... Uh, still very early works, but printed works. Um, and um, you can see an example of the um, what's called a chained library, where the most important and um, protected um, books were actually quite literally chained to the shelves so that they could not be removed. Um, all you can do is pull them down, put them on the, the counter and read them and then uh, put them back. They can't go any further than that. Um, and it's also well worth exploring the cloister of the cathedral, which uh, are also 13th century. Wells was never actually a monastery. Um, so the cloisters were not strictly necessary um, from a religious standpoint, but they were built anyway. Um, and they are quite beautiful. And uh, they're on the south side of the cathedral and give you a very nice view of the tower. And the whole complex around the cathedral um, is, is actually quite extensive. This is the Bishop's Palace, which is a little further away um, and surrounded by a moat and is now almost just like a public park where you'll find people strolling, pushing babies in prams and so forth, um, sitting, enjoying the weather. It makes for very nice um, afternoon strolls. Um, I mentioned also, um, not very far from here, about five miles away, is Glastonbury, that um, tower that you could see from all the way back in Cheddar. Um, Glastonbury is a little bit smaller than Wells, about 9,000 people. Um, and we stayed in this um, very interesting 
old Georgian, Georgian mansion that had been turned into a bed and breakfast, um, quite a quirky bed and breakfast, in fact, called uh, the Covenstead. This was the view from our room way up in the attic. What makes this place interesting um, and kind of fun, at least for a night, um, was that uh, Glastonbury has kind of become a little bit like Salem here in Massachusetts or other places I would compare it to are like Sedona in Arizona. It's a, a sort of new agey paranormal center where a lot of people um, sell things related to crystals and um, tarot card readings and all that kind of hoo-bah. Um, but um, even if you're not into that kind of thing, it, it is, the, the atmosphere is fun. Um, and this house was just um, quite a place to stay. Um, this is the breakfast room. <laughs> the inn is very weird, full of completely bizarre furniture, uh, things that they've collected over the years. Um, here's the front hall. And way up in the attic, um, this was our <laughs> the room that we stayed in, which had artwork all over the place, um, an excess of throw pillows. Here I am um, resting in bed. Um, but it's a beautiful town. Um, it's a very typical British market town um, going back as early as the 12th century when the cathedral was um, getting started. Um, it's, um, it has long also been connected with the legend of King Arthur. Um, there were some medieval monks in that time period who tried to encourage the story that um, Glastonbury was the location of Avalon. Um, and of course, they were doing this not necessarily with any documentary evidence, um, but it was a great way to attract pilgrims to your town um, and help your local economy. Um, and it worked. And so it's been a very successful market town ever since then. Um, and these days, um, it's, it's just a pleasant place. There's a lot of restaurants. Um, if you like new age stuff, there's shops galore where you can buy books and crystals and incense and all kinds of stuff. It also happens to have a couple of very important historic sites. Um, our hotel was right across the street from Glastonbury Abbey, which is quite old, um, founded in the seventh century and then destroyed in the 1100s and then completely rebuilt. And by the 14th century, it was one of the most powerful and uh, richest of all the monasteries in England. Um, but of course, like many others, it was suppressed during uh, the dissolution of the monasteries under Henry VIII. So there's not a whole lot left to it, um, but it is a, a historic site and you can tour the ruins. Um, and you can also just explore the town where there are lots of these nice little alleys with pubs and restaurants and shops. Humorously named side streets. And of course, um, one of the other big things to do is to make a climb all the way up to um, the top of the tour, which is uh, where you see the tower. Um, all that's really left is um, this tower. This was originally a church called St. Michael's. Um, and the church was later destroyed, um, and all that's left of it is the tower. And it's about 500 feet up, but it's not a terribly difficult climb. It's just on the outskirts of the town. And when you get up there, um, the views in all directions are really beautiful. The church that was uh, originally built here was made of wood and um, subsequently burned down. Um, so they rebuilt it in stone, and then that one fell down in an earthquake. Um, and then when uh, Henry VIII came along, he pulled down the rest of it so that um, all that's left um, since that time period is the church tower, the bell tower. But when you get up to the top, you can see just how um, beautiful the countryside is. And um, if you go late in the afternoon, that's again, the best time to be there. Unfortunately, you won't be alone because there will be plenty of other tourists and new age types um, who will be there uh, enjoying the spirituality of the site um, and to watch the sun go down over the, the countryside to the west. Um, here is actually from the top of the tour looking 
um, back north, just a few miles, you can see all the way back to, uh, this is Wells Cathedral, the town of Wells right behind it, um, just a few miles away. Um, it definitely attracts quite a crowd, um, although I was surprised it could have been much worse when we were there, given how beautiful the weather was. Um, there will be people um, meditating, ringing bells, burning incense, and getting in touch with their inner selves. But even if you don't have a new age bone in your body, um, it's absolutely worth it to go up there because the view is spectacular. And it, you can see why it has become such a spiritual place because um, it does have a sort of unearthly beauty, particularly at this time of day. So we're going to make a swing back, um, heading back towards London. Um, technically, um, technically, we are no longer in Somerset, but um, I'm just going to show you a couple of interesting sites um, that didn't fit into any of the other programs that I'm doing. Um, I did have to stop here. Um, speaking of, uh, if you remember back at the beginning of the program where we looked at a chalk horse, a 3,000 year old chalk horse, um, you can stop at the Kerne Abbas Chalk Giant. Um, and he is famous for quite obvious reasons, as you can see. Um, he has considerable attributes. Um, uh, technically, he's in Dorset, um, but this is a figure that is about 180 feet high. Um, not anywhere near as old as the horse that we saw earlier. Um, and the origins aren't completely clear, although um, I remember reading just a few weeks ago, they did some um, studies and there is a new theory. Um, for a while, it was thought that it was actually created in the 18th century, perhaps as a political satire. Um, and they did some uh, uh, date testing um, and were able to determine that it, it isn't 3,000 years old, but it's considerably older than they thought it was. Um, and um, so it's kind of interesting to, to try and you, you would think that something this big um, and this, um, well, <laughs> it's it kind of noteworthy, um, as you can tell. It's hard to imagine that you could build something like this into the side, side of a mountain and have nobody be quite sure where it came from. Um, but that's what history is like sometimes. Um, we also um, had, I had to make a pilgrimage to this um, little series of villages just because I've always loved the names. Um, there's a series of villages called the Wallops. Um, this is Nether Wallop. There's also Middle Wallop and Over Wallop. Um, Britain, of course, is full of all kinds of humorous, um, at least to us, um, uh, funny, funny sounding place names. Um, and this is high on a lot of people's lists, but they're, they are beautiful little towns. Um, and the name actually comes from Old English um, and refers to a small valley or, or glen that has freshwater springs in it. So that's where, where the original name comes from. Um, and it's a beautiful area to drive through. And I will finish tonight's program by uh, taking you all the way back almost to London. We're actually not very far from Heathrow Airport. And if you are ever in that area waiting for a flight and you have a couple of hours to kill, I would highly recommend stopping at Strawberry Hill, which is just outside of London in Twickenham in the Western suburbs, very close to Heathrow Airport. Um, Strawberry Hill um, has long been a place I've, I've wanted to visit because I was an architectural student and it is very important um, as one of the earliest examples of the Gothic revival um, in architecture, which reached its height in the early 19th century, like the, up until about 1850 or so. Um, this house uh, mansion was built by um, an artist and writer and art historian named Horace Walpole. And um, he built and expanded the house um, over a period of time, mostly from about the 1740s to the 1770s. And what makes it important is how early it was. He was one of the first people to actually um, take the Gothic style from centuries earlier and uh, turn it into a then 
um, modern contemporary artistic style that you would use in the decoration of houses. And it really kicked off um, an incredible um, fascination for Gothic revival and other uh, revival styles in the 19th century. Um, so once you got into uh, the 1800s, Gothic revival was everywhere, including here in the United States. You will see Gothic revival cottages all over New England and, and elsewhere in the country. And this is one of the earliest places on earth where it happened. So it's kind of interesting in that respect. It is now a museum and they have, um, although much of the house is empty, um, they have gradually been able to uh, reacquire some of the pieces of Walpole's original art collection. And you can explore both the outside of the house, uh, which has some lovely grounds um, and gardens around it, um, but it's the inside that really is the most impressive. Um, it's every single room is extravagant. It's not a particularly big house and the rooms themselves aren't large. Um, this is not a Newport mansion with enormous um, banquet halls. Um, most of the rooms are pretty intimate in size um, and the detail, the, the Gothic detail is just unbelievable. Most of it is in plaster um, or in wood. This is looking up to the top of the stairwell. Um, and it is still, um, uh, it's had numerous owners over the years um, and also multiple restorations, which is kind of interesting because um, they have exhibits about how they have tried to um, go through the different layers of paint and layers of wallpaper and so forth to understand the history of the house and how it changed over time after after uh, Walpole was gone and it moved into other um, ownership. There's some beautiful stained glass. Um, a couple of the rooms have been restored with furnishings that would have been appropriate to the time when, when Walpole was living in it. He was a collector, of course, so um, he was interested in interior design. He was interested in um, painting and decorative arts. So a lot of the, the point of the house was to have, um, to, to represent a, a particular style. And he collected his, his things accordingly. This is the stairwell again. Um, but the extravagant detail is if, um, if you're at all interested in, um, stately homes or, or decorative arts of any kind. It's a fascinating place to visit. The highlight of the house is um, the fan vaulting in this long gallery, um, which echoes many of the kinds of Gothic churches um, that if you've traveled to England, you've probably seen this. This is a very typical English style. Um, and you can see why it's called fan vaulting for obvious reasons. Um, but there are a number of important uh, churches in England that use this style in their ceilings, like Winchester Cathedral and also Westminster Abbey, if you've been there. Um, it's a very particularly British look. Um, and this, um, this gilded ceiling is, is just stunning, um, particularly with the red walls. So it was a really nice way to end our trip, uh, this long car trip that we had taken um, over, uh, I want to say about almost three weeks. Um, this was a nice way to just sort of uh, spend a little time before we headed back to the airport to see one last fascinating place. Um, and it's a bit off the beaten path. I mean, well, in the sense that, uh, it's hardly hard to get to. It's very close to London. And like I said, it's, it's just minutes from the airport, but surprisingly few people visit it. Um, and it's just not as high on a lot of people's um, lists of top sites. But if you're at all interested in the history of design, the history of interior design or, or architecture, it's, it's absolutely worth the visit. This is the library. And you can see the ceiling a little bit as well. And I will end there. Um, just 
15 minutes from the airport, so you can hop a plane and head home. I will turn off my screen sharing and let's catch up on some of the questions. Um, sure. Do feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask me anything you'd like, and I'll let me take a look at some of the questions that are in the chat. I can ask you, um, Jeff, this is Jessica, sure. I can ask you some of the ones that um, we left off at. I think, um, did you answer Elena, Elena Hart's question about culinary delights that you had in that part of England and anything from traditional New England cooking at all that might um, relate to New England cooking, I guess? Um, not that comes to mind. We did have obviously have great cheese and cheddar, <laughs> um, and um, because much of this trip was spent um, visiting friends, we often were eating at home with them, um, or just in the local pubs, which was kind of nice. Um, one thing I've noticed from growing up in New England um, is just how much, um, even today, uh, a lot of people move around much more than they did earlier, you know, decades ago. But there's still a surprising amount of um, that I find in New England that is kind of leftover connections from um, from Britain, um, mm -hmm. expressions and vocabulary that we use, things about our accents um, and food and things like that. I I realized I was talking to a colleague of mine who grew up in um, not far from Worcester, and. We both grew up here uh, referring to our mothers as mom, not mom, mm -hmm. but mom. Um, and that was very normal for us. Um, and uh, I've talked to a number of people who have had similar experiences. And um, I think a lot of New England cooking um, is a mix of the new world ingredients mm -hmm. that people found when they got here. Um, so uh, corn and molasses and all that kinds of stuff, um, cranberries, but um, laid over the kinds of traditional meat and potatoes kind of food that um, was very traditional in Britain for so long. Of course, today in England, there's um, England has such a reputation for boring food, but that hasn't been true for a long time, particularly in the cities where there's uh, there's so many different influences from immigrant cultures and um, is, so English food is very different from what it was a hundred years ago. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, my my parents were um, my parents are from Manchester, England, <clears throat> and oh, okay. um, they so they they grew up with the um, or they went to college with the um, the Curry Mile, which is mm. in Manchester, and so they we I grew up knowing that curry was a really delicious like yeah. Indian curry was a really delicious um, dish, and so uh, but I also love shepherd's pie too. I, but the oh, first I, time, yeah. the first time I tried a shepherd's pie in a real English pub, though, it was there was so much salt. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I yeah. so what was it? Michael Pearson says we've been there. So beautiful. Oh yeah. So a lot of people have. Oh, Roz asked, did you go to the Cheddar Caves? We didn't go inside the caves, mm -hmm. um, just because of timing and. Um, the weather was so beautiful we hated to be like underground um and i've i've been to many caves in my travel so it, it was something we skipped um but um there are uh, a number of caves one in particular there's a big one that uh, you can visit yeah we didn't happen to do it when when we were there i see someone mentioned that they um, lived in swindon um, yes in their teens and um a friend lives very close to the roundabout. It, it, it occurred to us as we were driving through it just for fun, how, what it must be like if that's like, you know, I'm in Wakefield and we do have one of the old rotaries um, on Route 128 is um, right, at, right here in town. So we're used to that. But what must it be like to grow up near the magic roundabout and go through that regularly on your commute or when you're going places? Yeah. Um, no, those are, they're nuts. I, I go through one on the Cape often. Um, oh yeah. I think it's from like, a, from not the Bourne 
is it the Bourne Bridge or one of the bridges There's one, leads yeah. onto, a, to, onto a rotary there and it's yeah, just exactly. nuts. Yeah. yeah. Um, Felicity is the same woman who said that she got the uh, PhD at Oxford and she said, great tour, reminded me of those old days in Oxford and Bristol, so thanks. Um, Bruce says, thanks, Jeff, looking forward to more presentations. Hopefully we can get you in the new year. Um, and then let's see. Recordings. Okay, I will send the link out to people um, just to make sure that everyone has access to those recordings, but I usually send out the recordings after the presentation, pretty, sh pretty shortly after the presentation, um, and it should be on our YouTube page and also um, they're Jeff also on phone, um, yeah. um, on on uh, the Wakefield Library's YouTube page. I don't have all of my programs, <clears throat> but many of them are there. I know this one is. Um, and um, I'm hoping to gradually fill in the ones that I haven't gotten to yet, because um, I know if, if people miss them, it's kind of nice to be able to catch them at your leisure. So okay. great. Can I ask a question about those sure. vaults in the Walpole yep. House, Strawberry Hill? Like those mm -hmm. fan vaults in that gallery, I they're so odd because, I mean, fan vaults hold up high Gothic ceilings, and that was a very short, low room. Exactly. This, um, oh. they were presumably not structural. Okay, um, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, Strawberry Hill is not even made of stone. Most of it is wood. Um, oh that goodness. might not have been obvious from the yeah. photographs. And that was kind of his point. He was, um, this was actually an old country house. Um, it was not a big stone mansion or anything like that. And he, um, he spent a long time uh, making these changes to it. Um, but most of it is not structural because it didn't need to be. It was just a wooden house. Mm. Um, so what, a lot of what looks like stone is actually carved wood or plaster decoration. Mm. So yeah, it's, uh, it's just for looks. And I just, I wanted to just add something about um, Wells because mm -hmm. we did spend a couple of days there actually. And I mean, one of the things that impressed me so much about Wells and the cathedral and not just Wells, but like Exeter Cathedral, and we went to Durham is, um, you know, that um, the cathedral close and the cathedral area, they're just such really nice communities of people, um, like that I don't think I tend to see in, um, well, I mean, you know, we have good community churches in the United States too, but I mean, they're like, um, you know, when they're not the touristy ones, I mean, they have, they have art, they have chorus, they have, and they're so, um, especially in Wells, I just remember they were so welcoming and they were like, thank you for coming to see our church. Yeah, and I, it was like, a, it was a park. I mean, the children were playing on the lawn with their dog all for an hour or two playing. It was yeah. just amazing. Yeah, I've had the same experience, not just in the big cathedrals, but even in a lot of small churches where people don't, they don't expect a lot of visitors. Yeah. Um, I, I'm trying to remember where it was. I want to say it was in Wales. Mm -hmm. um, we went with somewhere we were, well, no, actually, maybe it was Cornwall. I remember going one place, um, uh, it was a particular church I wanted to see, very small, um, little parish church in a village in the middle of nowhere, and we happened to be there on a Sunday morning. Um, and so I stuck my head in, but you don't want to interrupt the local people having their services. I just wanted to kind of see. And their reaction, of course, was, no, 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 come, come. Uh, please join us. And, yeah. you know, I said, I was just the fact that you're interested in the church They're they're thrilled to have somebody come and visit. And, um, yeah, I mean, but like, for me, I mean, like Wells Cathedral or Durham or Exeter, they're these world class works of art. And for these people, it's their church. And it's their local it's church. So yeah, amazing. Yeah. So. yeah, that's a that's a really great point. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Well, I will. And they be, have cats. And they, <laughs> <laughs> that's my only other point. They have cats and, um, and dogs. Um, and dogs. Um, as as a dog lover, I enjoy the fact that um, almost any pub we went to for dinner, there were the local dogs are all kind of hanging around. 
on under your feet. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I like that atmosphere. Are um, you doing so, a talk next week, next month? I mean, is it, I will not be doing month? one next month because I will be traveling. Um, oh, wow. I am retiring next week, and so I am going to be able to spend the whole um, month um, in Greece, um, enjoying um, our house and hosting some friends and uh, not thinking about work. Um, but um, <laughs> we're so, yeah. So I will be, uh, but I will be doing a program. Uh, Jess and I just scheduled one for the very beginning of December. Um, and I'm happy to continue in doing them for you guys as long as you want me to. So. Absolutely, they're, they're, they're so popular. And um, oh, good. I'm glad. I mean, I think this was like a, this was a dip because people are kind of getting adjusted to the new year, but I honestly think that this will be a good thing to do through the winter. Um, we can't travel. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Since, since we can't travel and also like while we're while we're indoors and we don't have to think about driving in the snow, it'll be great. Yep. Um, so we will um, definitely have uh, we have scheduled one for December 1st. Jeff is going to uh, is going to present his new program on Athens, Greece. So that should be a great one for oh. that that time of year. And then um, uh, we'll we'll go from there and we'll keep you all posted. But in the meantime, I also will uh, send you all out the recording and I will send you a link to our newsletter because we have lots of great programs, um, virtual programs going on throughout the winter. And then um, I will also share some other links to other programs. But thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you, Jeff, and have a wonderful congratulations on your retirement and have a wonderful, wonderful vacation. Thanks. Good night, Good night. everyone. Good night.